What is up, guys? This is Nick Hernandez back here with another episode of NHTV. So what if I told you that this phone right here was created by one of the co-founders of Android, comes with a premium design, top-of-the-line specs, and a stock Android build with zero carrier bloatware? You'd think I'd be talking about a Pixel, but I'm not. This is the Essential PH1, or the Essential Phone, and after some time of using it, would I consider it as a pixel in disguise? At first glance, it's different in terms of design, but the overall feeling of premium materials is actually higher than that of a pixel. It's your typical glass and metal design, but the back is made of ceramic glass and the sides are made of titanium. There's a nice heft to carrying it in the hand, but it's not the most comfortable to hold. The flat back and square sides make it more fatiguing to hold in the hand, but the sacrifice for design is well worth it. It's an overall stunning device, and if you didn't notice, the device ships with no carrier branding anywhere on the phone. This adds to the sleek nature of the device, which reminds me of a phone a guy like James Bond would use. But it doesn't stop there. The front of the device sports a screen similar to that of the iPhone X. It's a 5.7 inch 2K LCD panel with a small notch at the top and a near borderless display. The notch doesn't affect visibility in most instances, and oftentimes I forgot it existed. The quality of the screen is great too. There are some nice whites and punchy colors at any viewing angle. It tends to give off a cooler screen resolution, which can't be adjusted in the settings by default. Watching movies, scrolling through the web, and playing games looks nice and crisp on this display. While I may be tempted to say that I would have taken a 1080p OLED panel instead, it's not a concern since this panel does well overall. Compared to the Pixel displays, I would take this one any day, given its bezel-less nature and better screen-to-body ratio. On the performance side, things begin to even out between the PH1 and the Pixel. The PH1 comes with a similar Snapdragon 835 CPU, Adreno 540 GPU, and 4GB of RAM. This is the standard for all flagships in 2017, but specs are not everything. You'd think that this phone would have little to no stutters or lags, but you'd make a wrong assumption. I'd say 90% of the time things are smooth, but 10% of the time where it is not is somewhat disappointing. I'm not sure if this is a problem with software or RAM management, but I wouldn't expect this out of a top of the line hardware. It's not all bad though because once the phone moves out of its lagginess, it is generally a smooth experience. The phone just never seems to get hot during most of my demanding instances. This allows for a comfortable experience in the hand while playing graphic intensive games or streaming movies from your service of your choice. I always like to make a comparison to my OnePlus 3, and so far, I can't tell if this phone is any faster than my OnePlus 3 which is very disappointing. A bright side to the experience is that this phone ships with a stock Android experience, which can be compared to the Pixel phones. The only non-Google-based app on this phone is the camera app, which I will talk about in a little more detail later. It's not Android Oreo out of the box, which may be disappointing to some, but Essential is already working through the beta version and it should be coming out in the near future. Stock Android is my favorite version of Android due to its simplicity and vanilla experience, but this can be seen as a deterrent to some since you don't get any of the extra features that you would get with a Samsung or LG smartphone. The combination of vanilla Android and the Snapdragon 835 chipset make for the chance at some great battery life. This turns out to be true with this phone. The 3040 mAh battery is enough juice to be able to power the device for a full day at the very least. I average between four to five hours of screen on time with an hour of phone calls each day and I would finish the day with about 15 to 20 percent of battery life left. This is rather impressive for me considering that this phone doesn't ship with an AMOLED display. If there is a need to charge up the phone for additional hours, the included Qualcomm Quick Charge 4.0 adapter included in the box will be able to provide enough hours to get you through the rest of the day. It's not as fast as dash charging, 
found on OnePlus devices, but it will certainly do. The biggest elephant in the room at this point has to do with the one feature that has many reviewers on YouTube advising people to stay away from this phone. This has to do with the dual cameras on the back. Let's look at the specs. The two cameras on the back function like those seen on most Huawei recent flagships. There is one dedicated RGB sensor and another dedicated monochrome sensor. Both are fit with the same 13 megapixel setup and an f1.85 aperture. Well, what does that mean for actual picture quality? Before I get into that, let's talk about the camera software in the official app. It is rather bare bones with things like HDR, flash, tap to focus, and exposure level slider as features within this app. There is also controls to activate things like portrait mode, monochrome mode, and slow-mo video. I like the addition to be able to shift the video settings with the tap of a button, but a glaring omission is the ability to shoot in manual mode. You'll have to download a third-party app in order to play around with the camera settings, which really feels like a lazy move on Essentials part. The app also seems to be dragged down by poor performance with instances where the autofocus doesn't work or going into a photo after a shot causes the screen to trip out before displaying the photo. Now to actual picture quality. I was able to capture some great shots in most instances which was pleasantly surprising. I was surprised because just about every reviewer slash YouTuber has bashed this phone for poor camera quality. Now, does it live up to the same standards as the iPhone 10 or Pixel 2? No, but it shouldn't be written off as a bad camera either. Colors look nice and vibrant, and there's a nice, balanced, dynamic range as well. HDR is advised only in the brightest scenarios, and it works relatively well in those conditions. The monochrome pictures that come out of this phone are much better than any other phone mentioned above with their filter applied over the photo. That is because the photo is a true monochrome shot. Low light photos is where you see the biggest difference between this phone and the Pixel. Oftentimes the focusing speed is slow and you have to keep your hand steady to avoid getting a blurry shot. Video quality is also above average in most instances with the auto recorded out of the device to be nice and clear. Stabilization doesn't rival that of the iPhone 10 or Pixel 2, but again, it's a pleasant experience either way. As a benchmark, I also downloaded the Google Camera APK, and while the experience was much more pleasant using that app, the pictures can go either way in most scenarios. My suggestion is to have both apps at your disposal, and if you need to be having a reliable shot in a quick instance, go with the Google Camera APK. One feature the Google camera does not offer is the option to be able to use the app to preview the 360 degree camera that can be attached to this device. The back magnetic prongs allows the modular camera to snap on with ease, but it may be scary the first time as you do it because when I did it, it made a loud smack on the back of the device. The overall design of the camera just reminds me of how much attention to detail Essential has kept in mind when designing these devices. It is small enough to fit in your pocket, but feels premium in the hand. Picture and video quality are to be expected. They are not the greatest and clearest of the bunch, but they are just so cool to look at. I find this will come in handy on my next trip, and I was always worried about not having my LG G6's wide-angle camera with me, but having a 360-degree camera can solve that issue and take my shots to a next level. Also, don't be alarmed by the fan that kicks on when you attach the module. It is meant to keep the cameras cool when using it with the phone. Some final features I want to highlight before I round up this review include my thoughts on the little things that make this phone great. The fingerprint scanner on the back doubles as a notification navigation key with a swipe down to be able to get to your navigations and all of your notifications. As a security feature, the scanner works easily with speed and high accuracy. The only gripe here is that the scanner is flush with the glass back, which makes it hard to find. 
but at least it's not right next to the camera. Here's looking at you, Samsung. The bottom firing speaker is nothing to write home about, but it does get quite loud and the sound quality is good enough for most multimedia purposes. There's 128 gigabytes of onboard storage, which will be enough for most people with no opportunity to expand that with a micro SD card. The lack of a headphone jack can be annoying in some instances, but I mainly use Bluetooth earbuds to listen to music in those instances. So it really doesn't affect me like it won't affect most people. The included adapter is nice, but the sound coming out of that adapter is quite low in terms of power and there is no depth in sound quality. I often find myself having to put the volume up in my car in order to get a decent volume out of this adapter, which is disappointing. Let's wrap up this review with an evaluation of this device based on the three price points that it has been priced at over the past six months. Let's start at the top. At launch, this phone was released at $699, and that is considered to be a normal price for most flagships in 2017. At this price, you should skip on getting this phone and get yourself into something more premium like the Huawei Mate 10 Pro, Google Pixel 2, or Razer phone. The reason being, those phones just have smoother experiences with their performance, and two of those three phones have a much better camera. With the recent price drop to as low as $449 on Amazon.com, it now becomes a question of the PH1 or OnePlus 5T. In my opinion, you wouldn't go wrong with either device at this price point, but the OnePlus 5T would still be a better choice just based on pure performance alone. I got this phone for $399 with a 360 degree camera included on the Cyber Monday deal and honestly no other phone comes even close when looking at that price point. This phone was an absolute steal at that price and I will proclaim that it is the best phone for the money that I have ever gotten. Thanks for watching my review on the Essential PH1. If you liked this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up below and subscribe to my channel for all of my future content. If you have any additional questions or comments, please feel free to leave me a comment in the section below. Thanks again guys and I'll catch you in my next video.